How does the class come together? The course is called the Wine Smart Course, a full-bodied framework to taste, pair, and buy wine like a pro. The people who take my course range from beginners to those who've taken professional courses because they really want to bone up on the food and wine pairing aspect, which it's not often a part of the professional designations. They tend to focus on regions and geography and history. And we definitely touch on that, but our big focus is on the pairings, which I think is so much more fun. The course itself is a mix of live online tastings, but they're all recorded, so you can always watch them later. There's workbooks and little quizzes, but you no. really can go at your own pace, and I give everyone lifetime access to the course. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 128. What is it about wine that makes it part of so many television shows and movies? Or maybe I'm just selectively noticing that. How does approaching wine through food make it so much more accessible? What adventures did I go on in writing my books? Why are origin stories so important when it comes to wine? And what's one rule of thumb you can use to find great value wines that taste twice as expensive as they cost? Well, I have answers for you in this episode of the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. We're turning the tables and Ron Hunt, host of the terrific All About Wine podcast, is interviewing me. Ron is a winemaker, cellar master, vineyardist, and tasting expert. And I love chatting with him about my experiences in the wine industry. In the show notes, you'll find a full transcript of our conversation, how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, and where you can find me on Zoom, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube live video every Wednesday at 7 p.m. That's all in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 128. Now, on a personal note before we dive into the show, I have a confession to make. I love Yacht Rock Radio. It's the Sirius XM channel dedicated to soft rock music from the 1980s. You know them all. Michael Bolton, Christopher Cross, Hall & Oates. And I can't help but laugh every time I hear the overly cool dude describe the channel as featuring Men with feathered hair who play smooth sailing tunes that won't rock the boat. <laughs> I just want that dude to pass me a joint, even though I don't smoke, as we stretch out on the dock on a sunny afternoon. The music and the dude make me chillax. Some wines do that for me as well, especially Pinot Noir. It's so smooth and medium-bodied. Could Pinot Noir be the yacht rock of wine? Or is that an insult to a wine that I find as complex as classical Baroque? Guess I really shouldn't worry about this and just chill. Okay, on with the show. Come on. Love Talk Radio. Here we go. This is All About Wine. The talk show dedicated to the wine industry since 2009. Featuring winemaker, cellar master, vineyardist, and tasting expert, Ron. Basically what we're trying to do on this program is just trying to educate people and trying to make wine less confusing and more friendly. From coast to coast and around the world. 
you know, we really have had some some neat people on the program. I, I just, I love that. Post your questions and comments during the live show on our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash allaboutwinebtr. Again, that's www.facebook.com forward slash allaboutwinebtr. And now, All About Wine is on. Here's Ron. Yay! Yes, it is. There we are. Another exciting week on All About Wine. Welcome to the show. It is Thursday, February. Yeah, you're right. February February. still is. February 27th. (laughs) And uh, welcome to the show. Mike and I were just talking. We have to talk about this for a little bit because it's the only place in the country right now that's this warm, but up to 85 degrees today here. And so AC time and we can take off our parkas and all that finally. But speaking of parkas, we were just talking about how cold it is from where our guest is. And oh my gosh, you know, it's 17 degrees there now. So yeah, Fahrenheit. Yeah. So Burr, burr. Well, uh, speaking of guests, she's been patiently waiting. She called it Natalie McLean. Let me read you all this about her. Let me tell you, this woman is, is really got quite a resume here. I was quite impressed when I first saw it. The New York Times selected her podcast, and she has a podcast, Unreserved Wine Talk podcast and New York Times selected as one of the seven best drinks podcasts in 2020. Oh, uh, yeah, that's, that's right. Apple featured it as one of the best listens of 2019. Wow. This podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, formerly iTunes, Spotify, Pandora, Sirius XM, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Amazon Music, Audible, and other podcast apps on iPhone and Android devices. Almost like All About Wine. We're available on quite a bit of stuff, too. We just don't know it. (laughs) (laughs) We don't know we're on some of those. They just take and put them on those, but we we are on And her guests have included writers for the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Associated Press, Bloomberg News, Forbes, Globe and Mail, San Francisco Chronicle, and other publications, including Karen McNeil, Tyler Mazio, Esther Mobley, Bianca Bosker, Elon, I believe, Elon McCoy, Madeline Puckett, Pete Hellman, Marnie Old, Mark Oldman, and others. Actually, you might not as listeners recognize a lot of those names, but those are people in the wine business. These are writers and people in the wine business. I recognize all of them. I you know, quoted them to you and some of the things I've talked about over the years and stuff like that. So these are quite a lot of the who's who of wine writing and wine blogs and stuff. And so they've all been guests. Natalie herself has largest wine review site based in Canada with over 3.2 million visitors a year and a wine newsletter with 270,000 subscribers. Largest wow. network of writers and bloggers in Canada. The only national mobile apps with real-time store stock inventory, barcode reader, and optical front label scanner. Now, Natalie, that's a question we need to find out if that's available throughout North America or just in Canada. And about Natalie herself, Natalie McLean's first book, Red, White, and Drunk All Over, A Wine-Soaked Journey from Grape to Glass, and her second book, Unquenchable, A Tipsy Quest for the World's Best Bargain Wines, were both selected as one of Amazon's best books of the year. She is the wine expert on CTVs, that's Canadian TV, The Social, Canada's largest daytime television show, CTV News, and Global Television's morning show. She was named the world's best drinks writer at the World Food Media Awards and has won four, not one, not two, not three, but four James Beard Foundation Journalism Awards. She is the only person to have won both the MFK Fisher Distinguished Writing Award from the James Beard Foundation 
and the MFK Fisher Award for Excellence in Culinary Writing from Aladam, oh, I'm going to destroy this name, Diaschofer International. Natalie also studied the Romantic Poets at Oxford University with Jonathan Woodsworth. She graduated with honors from the Masters of Business Administration at the University of Western Ontario. Before joining the wine world, she worked at Procter & Gamble in brand management and then at the supercomputer company SGI in Mountain View, California, now the headquarters of Google. And with all those great accolades and everything, she is humble enough to come on All About Wine and talk with us. Welcome to the show, Natalie. Hey, Ron. It's great to be here with you. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm glad you took out the time tonight to visit with us. I uh, was really oh, looking it's forward to it. my pleasure. Absolutely. I've been listening to your show, too, and I just love the talk radio nuance to it. I, I think you do a great job. Well, thank you very much. We enjoy it. Mike and I have been doing this for over 10 years now, and it's something we mm. Really, really enjoy doing. Look forward to every week. Although we do have our glitches like anything with electronics, but it's something we do enjoy. So thank you. Thank you for listening to it. Um, Absolutely. So quite a resume there. You've been busy since what? You were about three years old doing all this stuff? (laughs) I started drinking early. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I actually came to wine quite late in life. Well, relatively speaking, I came from a good Scottish family on the East oh. Coast, Nova Scotia, and it was beer and whiskey on the table, not wine. And so it wasn't yeah. actually until my late 20s that I got into wine. But boy, did I make up for time with the drinking, I mean. <laughs> yes, I know. You know, it's funny because we've talked to some of our guests over the last three or four months, and a lot of them seem to be getting into wine later in life. I don't know what it is, but... Uh... I started back when I was in my mid twenties, early twenties, but a lot mm-hmm. of the people are starting later and it seems to be something that once you start later in life, it just grabs you and you just you mm-hmm. say, Wow, how did I miss this this long? So Absolutely. Uh, it really woke me up to just how much wine is connected to everything. I mean, you and I and a lot of us here are biased towards that, but I just think, you know, it connects to art and literature and Commerce and agriculture, I mean, it's just everything. You can make wine the center of your universe. <laughs> and they, they do. I mean, guilty pleasure. I'm Right now, I am going through the entire library of the Game of Thrones. And if there is one underlying theme, it's wine. I mean, it's just yeah. that's all they're doing is drinking wine and the whole thing. So. That's just another aspect of it. It's just used in TV shows and stuff like that a lot, too. It's acceptable. And I think that's one of the reasons why they do it on TV shows more than anything, except for Mad they Men, do. of course. They have cocktails. Well, that was yeah. the whiskey days, I guess, the hard drinking days. But I watch a lot of shows like The Good Wife and others. I mean, mm-hmm. wine is just uh, a necessary prop, it seems, for every oh. nighttime scene going. <laughs> it, it seems to be, yeah. And it's so accessible. What did I tell you I wanted to ask you about when we were going through stuff here? Oh, yeah, the mobile app. Yes. Is that national just Mm -hmm. in Canada or is that North America or can I load it? You can download it wherever you are. The mobile apps uh, for Android and iPhone, iPad, are Mm -hmm. available wherever you live around the world. You can access my scores and tasting notes and, you know, you can keep a virtual seller in there. And the unique thing about it is that... It has a front label reader, but it also will read back barcodes. They're two different scanners, two different technologies that work together. So it's a better chance of finding the wine that you're looking for. Fantastic. Oh, that's one of those apps that is almost a necessity to have on your phone. Hear that, people? Get that loaded onto your phone. That is a great way to go out and do stuff. With the app, can you make notes with it? Yeah, you can keep like a virtual seller, so you can make notes. And you can just scan the label or scan the barcode and add it like with a click to your virtual seller. So you're not typing in the whole wine name and all of that. And then if I've reviewed it, my tasting notes will be part of your seller entry so that, you know, you have more information and food pairings. It sort of all works together. And if you find one you like, you can do it that way and and mm-hmm. refer back to it. Fantastic. There you go. If you exactly. if everyone out there listening to this does not download that, then... You know, you're missing, definitely missing out on something on that. 
What is it called it's in a, the uh, app store? It's under my name. So folks search on Natalie McLean, and it's N-A-T-A-L-I-E, and McLean. I'm a Mac, not a Mick. M-A-C-L-E-A-N. So if you search on that, that's my website too. So you can find it that way through my website, or you can just search on the app stores. Or NatalieMcLean.com <laughs> slash mobile app. And yep, that's right. That'll do exactly. it right there for you too. It really does cover all the bases on that too. And then your website has reviews too of wine. Now those are just wine reviews that is listed on there? Yes. So, I mean, I've been writing about wine and tasting and reviewing for almost 20 years now. So wow. there are a lot of reviews and I invite others to post their reviews of wines as well. And wow. then I have a team of bloggers who contribute. So there are a lot of professional and consumer reviews on it so that you get multiple opinions. Wow. Not and over wine. a period of years, that's probably quite a library there of different information. Yeah. Well, Fantastic. right now there's more than 300,000 reviews, wine reviews. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So. Lots. Yeah, it's more than just an easy weekend reading, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so, so, okay, I'm, there's just so much, I have so many questions here. And I have to share with people out there, Natalie knew I didn't get a chance to read her books, and so she sent me a list of questions on there, which is really great. I will be using some of those, by the way, if I don't cover it otherwise. But there's a lot of other stuff I want to talk about here. And that sure. is the... New York Times has named you one of the seven best drinks podcasts of 2020. Does that include wine or spirits and beer or is? Mm -hmm. Right. They do a regular feature on the seven best podcasts in a variety of categories, whether it's movies or books or whatever. So for drinks, I had three wine podcasts. And then the other four were like cocktails, spirits, beer, mixed drinks, that sort of thing. And mm. it surprised the heck out of me. I just, it was like one day I woke up, there was a Google alert in my inbox because of course I set up alerts. And it was <laughs> from them, it was like, holy smokes. I didn't even know they were looking at it or whatever. It was just, it was um, made my year actually, <laughs> not my day. Yeah. My well, year. you know, <laughs> I have to brag a little bit here too. All About Wine was named one of the top six in Wine Spectator magazine in 2020 oh, as a wine podcast to listen to. So congratulations, that's uh, well, really you. prestigious. Absolutely, yeah, I, well deserved. Well, thank you. We were as shocked as you just said you were. It was like, oh my gosh, you know. And then there was another list that was composed of the 25 best ones to listen to. It wasn't by Wine Spectator, but I don't know who it was that put it together. But we were number twelve on that list. So Wow. You know, it's wow, it's always Yeah, it's always nice to be recognized. I mean, you know, and I'm sure you you agree with that. It's always nice to know that people out there reading you and you know, you're getting recognized by it. Exactly, because uh, I think if we do podcasts, I mean I know with unreserved wine talk, my desire is just to go. And so while well, these, you know, the lists and the recognition is nice. What gets me so excited is that I think, oh, God, I get to connect with more people because they'll find out about it now. Because, <laughs> you know, the, the discovery is kind of challenging, you know, unless you get recommended by a friend, you know, your podcast or in one of these lists. But I just get excited from that perspective. Exactly. And as do I, I think that being on those lists to get people to say, oh, look, maybe, you know, and then I've been contacted by some people, I'm, I'm sure, because of those lists, which mm -hmm. is a good thing. Speaking of being contacted with people, how do you get your guests? For a while, I was calling wineries and stuff and getting mm -hmm. wineries as guests. And that's always a fallback. I'm, you know, I can always get a hold of wineries because wineries love to talk about their wines and what they do mm -hmm. and all that. But uh, you've talked to a lot of people here that, well, like I said before the show, in the business, writers and bloggers and all that. How do you get your guests? Yeah. Call them up say, hey, I'm having a show. You're going to be on with me? Or <laughs> yeah, mostly it's cold calling or cold <laughs> emailing. But uh, first and foremost, Ron, I'm looking for great storytellers, which is mm. why I've invited you to be on the Unreserved Wine <laughs> Talk podcast as well, as you know. Um, well, thank you. Yes, but that's yeah. what I'm looking for because that's what people want. You know, I agree with you. Winemakers love to talk about their wine, but unless they can tell a great story and we can learn from it, 
I don't care about how tight the weave of the oak is or, you know, when you pick between the raindrops. I want to be taken someplace in my mind. I want you to paint me a picture and tell me a story. And that's why I often have a lot of writers, you know, who've just published books or have a great column or who have a great show like you do, because you're great storytellers. And I think that's how we learn. I really fully understand and agree with that, too, because I've, whenever I talk to wineries, I always ask them about how they start and stuff like that. And they love to tell the beginnings, the how it all came about to where they are now. And that's really one of my favorite parts of it. I do ask them about other things, the vineyard and the oak and all that. But that humble beginnings is always a fun yeah. part in any of those stories. And because people can identify that. We all came from somewhere. We all had humble beginnings and had to start from scratch. And there are a lot of people, as you know, Ron, who probably imagine or dream of a career in wine, whether oh. it's making wine or writing about it or whatever. And so it's sort of this sort of aspirational thing that because a lot of people have a passion or it's a hobby, wine is a hobby, and they think, what if I got paid to do this full time? How cool <laughs> yeah. would that be? So I'm sure they love the origin stories. Yes. Yeah. Origin stories are always, always interesting too. Before I forget, you sent me an email that said that you would like to offer all the listeners your ultimate guide to food and wine pairing. And yes. Well, I'll let you get the site and tell them about it uh, instead of me doing it. So, Oh, sure. So, yeah, it's a handy sort of guide template to the major categories of food, the major categories of wine. And it's a sort of a reference for when you're looking for great pairings. You know, you know what you're having for dinner food-wise, but you're thinking, what am I going to do with wine? Or conversely, mostly the way I start, I've got the wine, now what am I going to eat? And so... <laughs> um, <laughs> I uh, put together this guide for your listeners, and they can get it, download it for free at nataliemcclain.com forward slash all about wine. So nataliemcclain.com forward slash all about wine. Simple as that, people. There you go. You got yourself a, your own personal guide for food and wine pairings. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Thank you. Thank you for offering that to the listeners, oh, too. It's, uh, my pleasure. I appreciate that. We've had some authors that have been on the show lately doing some simple books and stuff like that. And I like the simplicity of that stuff too, because most people out there, as you probably discovered, most people aren't as learned in the whole field of wine as just a handful are. So the simplicity of information, I think, is a key. And everyone I've talked to on the show has agreed that that is really the only approach it is. And I think we're far less intimidated by food. Like you look at a roast chicken and you don't worry that, you know, you haven't consulted that chicken's vintage chart. But we're <laughs> so uptight when it comes to wine, you know, because there's so many more choices and we can't try before you buy, usually, at least not legally. So I think bringing in people through the world of food, it makes it so much more accessible. And that's why I really, really focus on food and wine pairing, like with this guide and with the online courses I teach. I just think it can connect with people so much more easily. Uh, yeah, and it's a very good approach to it. You're absolutely right. Speaking of online courses, you mm -hmm. do online courses. Would you tell us about that? Sure. So I come from a long line of English teachers. So teaching's in my blood. And I taught Highland dancing for years to little kids. And that's how I got through university. But teaching... Now, online, these wine and food pairing courses is just, I think I've arrived home in that I just love it. I love the connection. And I love what technology has been able to do for us with reaching new people and bringing them together this way. And I think, you know, I mean, there's not been a lot of great things related to COVID, but one positive is that people have gotten over the mental block that, oh, you can't take a wine course online. What are you going to do? Like text me the wine? But <laughs> you can. <laughs> you yes, can. you can. There's so yeah. many advantages to it. Like you can be in your pajamas and you don't have to get a babysitter for the kids. You don't have to drive. You don't have to commit even to a certain day because a lot of the classes can be recorded if you miss one. And so I love that. And that in my classes, I have lots of people from the U.S. and Canada mainly, but, you know, there's someone from the Netherlands. There's someone taking the class over breakfast in Sydney, Australia. 
<laughs> and I just love those those worldwide connections that we all sort of meet at this virtual kitchen table and talk about wine. And do you do uh, pairings? Do you cook mm-hmm. while you're doing it and explain it to people? Or how does the class come together? What is the basis of it? Sure. So the course name, the main course is called the Wine Smart Course, a full-bodied framework to taste, pair, and buy wine like a pro. And that's on my website at nataliemcclain.com. And so we sort of go from step to step. We want to first learn how to taste wine, but we really focus in on the pairing. So the people who take my course They range from beginners to those actually who know a lot about wine, even those who've taken other professional courses because they really want to bone up on the food and wine pairing aspect, which it's not often a large part of some of the professional designations. They tend to focus on regions and geography and history, and we definitely touch on that, but our big focus is on the pairings, which I just think is so much more fun. So the course itself is a mix of live online tastings. But they're all recorded, so you can always watch them later. And then there's pre-recorded videos. There's workbooks and little quizzes. And But you no. really can go, go at your own pace, and I give everyone lifetime access to the course. Oh, wow. Fantastic. You know, the, you say during COVID, has COVID changed your – well, obviously it has. But, I mean, has mm-hmm. it changed your approach to your writing? Yeah. I'm trying to respond to what – people want to learn now. And I think a lot of folks who have not been able to go to restaurants or to travel to wine regions are looking to really elevate their wine and food experience at home. So a lot of what I'm writing about is how to have like a little informal wine tasting, maybe just you and your partner. So, you know, it's not fancy or, you know, pairing wine with comfort food or unusual pairings, or, you know, even pairing wines with your latest Netflix bin show. But it's a lot of home-based kind of what can you do at home with wine that would be fun and get you out of maybe if you feel you're in a rut, (laughs) wine-wise, or that sort of thing. Yeah, that's kind of my focus lately. Yeah, I was going to say COVID has changed. Well, the tasting world and all that stuff has changed, but I think with the virtual tastings, which I love, it's just a wonderful approach to virtual tastings. I think people can still enjoy just as much as before. Mm-hmm. I have to come. The food, this is something, and my listeners know, I've mentioned food, how great wine can enhance food and how great food can enhance wine. And mm-hmm. I think it's always been a question in the back of people's minds. And even mine, you know, there's just times where I'm saying, well, what's going to go with this? And you start thinking of the possibilities. But a lot of times, and I don't know if you agree with me or not, but a lot of times what can go with it is limited to the individual's history of tasting the wines that they've tasted. And mm-hmm. if you open it up to, well, like your site there, you're saying, okay, try this and this with it, it could enhance that food even more so than what you might imagine. So mm-hmm. to be able to get other people's perspective, and again, even your perspective is limited to what you've experienced. Exactly. Other, like A good you know. example for me was learning that okay, if you've got a steak and it's been nicely caramelized on the outside, why don't you try a buttery oak-aged Chardonnay? You would think Cabernet, got to go to Cabernet. But the caramelization in the steak and the oak aging in the Chardonnay just tasted divine together. It was like, wow. And they both had equal weight. It was full-bodied. The wine was full-bodied. So was the steak, obviously. But yeah, getting out of those comfort zones and just experimenting. That's the fun of it. Uh, Yeah, without question, that is. And I'm constantly telling people, you know, food and wine, those are the great things. Get yourself different pairings there and experiment with different ones, if nothing else, you know, try something new with it. But that's a great idea. A good oaky Chardonnay with a nice caramelized sirloin or something. (laughs) (laughs) Very good. So again, if y'all are interested in it, we'll have Natalie give it to you again. I can just go to her website. Everything's on her website, nataliemacclain.com. Not Mac. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Now, 
your books. You have two books out. Your first book is... Uh, Red, White, and Drunk All Over. Okay. With subtitle, A Wine Soaked Journey from Grape to Glass. Okay. Is this... From the beginning, this is what a grape looks like on the grapevine to, ooh, do you taste that aftertaste? Is that basically what this is? <laughs> sort of, <laughs> but that would be a metaphor for the life experience because in, in the book, because I took the day in the life approach. Oh. Yeah, who is this? Uh, George Plimpton was it, who played football then wrote about it. It was yes. kind of the new school of journalism where you did the thing to have a better and deeper experience in order to write about it, not from the outside, but from the inside. And so that's what I did in Red, White, and Drunk All Over. So I actually helped or worked at the Harvest. That was with Randall Graham in California, a uh, crazy genius. And I worked as a sommelier. I worked in wine stores. So it was like each chapter was a different aspect of wine where I did the thing I wrote about. Oh, well, that sounds yeah. a, a, like a good approach. You said you worked as a sommelier. Do you have your sommelier certification? Yeah, I do. I took yeah. a diploma program here in Canada, but it was just for kicks at night. I wasn't even thinking, oh, I'll write about this. It just drew me in, as you said, near the beginning of our conversation. Just once I glommed onto wine, it was like, I need to learn everything I yeah. can about this. And so I went through that and... Yeah, of course. but working as a sommelier is a quite a different thing. It's like being out yeah. on the floor, and I chose to turn up the burner underneath my feet and work at a <laughs> four-diamond restaurant, and it was like, oh, my gosh. I was just mostly trying to look like a shrub that no one would notice in the corner. But <laughs> it was fun. Where's the sommelier? Where is, that? Where is she? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, so... The book, basically, what, each chapter is each aspect of it until... Yes, exactly. So we start off with how is wine made, but instead of sort of a dictionary definition, I go and help oh, and favorite. work the harvest with, you know, Randall Graham, and I talk about, you know, what it's like. But through those stories, you learn about wine. It's like when my mother used to put the peas in the mashed potatoes. I love those mm-hmm. mashed potatoes. And she'd sneak in the vegetables. So the learning is snuck in there through the storytelling and you still come out the other end having learned, but it was a tasty adventure along the way. Yeah. It sounds like a, sounds like a fun book. And then you enjoyed writing that so much. You wrote your second book, Unquenchable. Uh, It was a gypsy quest for the world's best bargain wines. This Mm -hmm. is a wine cheap state at heart. (laughs) Yeah, really. It's a a completely different approach than the first one. This one, it sounds anyway. Yeah. This one was, travel-based. So I would go to a different wine region where I thought there would be great wine values. So Argentina for Malbec and Australia for Shiraz. And it was still adventure-based in that I did some sort of crazy things to bring out the learning and the stories about what is value and how do we get smarter about wine. Like in South Africa, I was shark diving and doing all sorts of milking goats and all kinds of crazy things, but there was a purpose to it always. And you would come away with, you know, some more tips in terms of what am I looking for in the liquor store when I don't have a specific bottle recommendation? How can I be smarter about buying wine? Because ultimately that book is about finding wines that taste twice as expensive as they cost. Yeah. If you can find it, that's a great deal. And, you know, I think that's the search for everybody who's into wine is always looking for that wine that you say, I only paid this much for this, but it tastes like it. Exactly. It's like the hunt. It's like why those designer outlet stores are so popular. It's just easy money. Dumb money can buy Versace at full price. But if you can get that designer jacket at 10% of its original price, well, then you're a smart shopper. And I think there's that thrill of the hunt is there in wine. And one tip I'll just share with you, because I think a lot of people like this one in particular is go south. So a lot of badge cachet regions in wine countries are north. So you think Bordeaux, Burgundy, expensive, go south to the Languedoc or Provence or even the Rhone Valley is going to be less expensive. Napa Valley, Sonoma, pricier than Paso Robles on average. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, Tuscany, Piedmont. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. 
Tuscany Piedmont, go south to Sicily or Puglia. You're going to get some great deals that way. So go south. And, and, <laughs> and that's very true. I mean, it, you think of the big names and all of them are north. And it doesn't mean that you can't find bargains. It's just a little bit harder to do it. And exactly. so you, you can find bargains immediately going south on there. Your book, you started out with Domain... Uh, Romani Conti. Yeah. Why start there? Was that the first stop in your adventures, or is there a reason for starting on that? Yeah, that was part of the first book, and it was a terrific experience because Burgundy often is the holy grail for Pinot Noir lovers. It's um, oh, you yeah. know, the, it's, yeah, the self-described pathological optimists who make Pinot Noir. <laughs> It's just like they're crazy because it's so difficult. It's called the heartbreak grape, as you know. <laughs> so, but I visited Aubert de Vilaine, who makes Domaine Romani Conti, which, you know, can go for hundreds of dollars or often thousands of dollars per bottle, like especially if you're trying to chase down something at auction. I wanted to start with the benchmark and find out what is the gold standard when it comes to this coveted wine. It was an extraordinary experience going around with him. It was in the winter and, you know, he's doing cane pruning to get ready for spring. But he was just so open and generous with his time. He doesn't have a tasting room that's open to the public. So I really felt honored. And we went down to his library cellar and he made me turn around and he pulled out a bottle and then he made me guess the vintage. It was like, oh, my God. <laughs> Leave me here with a corkscrew. Don't quit me like this. <laughs> but it was extraordinary. You know, when people say, wow, how did you get in to see Aubert de Vlaine and these other people? And I always say, you know what? It's not me. It's who I bring with me. And those are the readers. It's who I represent. Who are the listeners on the podcast or the readers of the book or the visitors to the website? That's the real power. The who's who are the people who are coming with me virtually. Mm hmm which answers a good question on there. How do you get all these different people to interview and all that? And hmm, my mind was going out thinking of, you know, how we get guests and stuff like that. And it's usually not a problem finding guests. You know, you say, I do this, I do that. Would you like to be on the show? And like we said at the beginning, people in the wine industry love to talk about wine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If someone has a new book to promote, they're usually quite keen. And that's a great time to interview them because the book is still fresh in their mind and they have some great stories to tell. So I'm usually monitoring who's got a new book out, you know, just published a book. That's mm. a great source for getting guests. Well, in fact, we had a guest on about a month ago now who his book was being released that week and he was ah. a guest on the program. That was in okay. fact, it surprised us. We didn't know it was being released just within the next few days. And he mentioned it during the show that it was coming out in a few days. Michael Brown and Pinot Rocks. Is, oh, yeah. Pinot uh, Noir. Yeah. He makes Pinot Noir, right? He's a uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and perfect. His book, Pinot Rocks, was just coming out uh, a few days after we interviewed, which was really cool because he said that it was on audiobooks and William Shatner actually read his book that is amazing oh yeah, i'm such so a william true. shatner fan I mean, oh. it's just like and, oh my god william shatner <laughs> and, yeah. i think william shatner had this sort of brown bag wine tasting thing on youtube or somewhere where he would oh, really? surprise people and get them to taste wine so he's a wine guy yeah oh, i was I watching that. that somewhere it's a while back but i just thought oh my gosh there's captain kirk yeah really <laughs> that's a yeah. wine perfect <laughs> I never, I never knew that. <laughs> the Tampa Bay Rays manager, oh, he's out in California now for the Angels. Oh, I could kick myself. I just, I uh, can't remember his name, but he was really into wine a lot. And I contacted mm -hmm. the Rays office and all that, and you know, told him, you know, no, he wouldn't be interested. And I got so mad at him, I yelled at him. I said, "How do you know he's not going to be interested? He's into wine." <laughs> you know, right. You pick one, you know, but they never That's connected crazy. me with him. That just irritated me so much that they don't give him a chance. You know, I just. You know. Oh, I get it. Yeah. Well, you know, here's yeah. a guest that I'm going to have in a couple of weeks' time. It, he's the publisher of the Washington Post, 
And oh, wow. why the heck would he want to even talk to me? Because he just came out with a book called Wine and the White House. So we're going to talk about the intersection ah. of politics and wine. Oh, right? well, that's so interesting. When someone well, has yeah. a book to promote, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, wine, wine, the politics of wine, I mean, all sorts of taxes and levies and fees and all that that's being kicked around and everything now, that should be a very timely interview there. You know, so. Yeah, and he's got all kinds of stories about past presidents and the things they did you know, in serving wine at diplomatic dinners. So again, I'm just looking for those stories that are colorful. Oh, yeah, yeah that, that should, be, <laughs> should be very interesting. Give that people something else to tune into and listen to. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Ron Hunt. In the show notes, you'll find a link to the full transcript of our conversation, how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, and where you can find me on Zoom, Insta, Facebook, and YouTube, live on video every Wednesday at 7 p.m., including this evening. That's all in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 128. You won't want to miss next week when I'll continue my conversation with Ron Hunt. In the meantime, if you missed episode 80, go back and take a listen. We're heading into prime rosé wine season, and I chat with Jill Barth about what is the allure of wines from Provence. I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. There is a preference for a pale rosé. I think that that's the consumer's idea that it embodies freshness and lightness. There also seems to be a misconception that it's going to be sweeter if it's darker. And that's not true at all. I've heard people I'm sharing wine with and they'll see a dark rosé and they'll think, oh, I don't like sweet wines. But it's to do with the varieties of the grape and how long that juice has any amount of skin contact. That makes total sense. People do seem to like the light ones these days for, I think, reasons of aesthetics, not necessarily that it influences the flavor as much as you might think. Sure. And is there anything to the fact that if it's a darker rosé, it's going to be more full body? Did it get more skin contact, therefore more flavor? Or is that to a generalization that doesn't always play out? It probably doesn't always play out, but it would hold true that darker skinned grapes that experience more skin contact during the winemaking are going to impart more of that color. If you like this episode, please tell one friend about it this week, especially someone you know who'd be interested in the tips that I shared. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week. Perhaps a crisp, refreshing rosé as you sit back Listen to Yacht Rock Radio. All right. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcclain.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.